let's uh, let's give Jay and Michelle a hand, shall we? Thank you. Really appreciated the emphasis throughout their presentation this morning. It's not about the programs, it's about the relationships. The Lord has given them creativity and ability to continue to reach out and to minister uh, to the best of their ability. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for your faithfulness in ministry. Uh, thank you for partnering with us and supporting us in the Great Commission. And we want to continue supporting you, praying for you guys, and encouraging in any way that we possibly can. When we uh, finish this morning, I'm not sure how the weather is going to affect fellowship on the parking lot. The latest forecast I saw was supposed to stop around noon or so. But maybe I need to preach a little bit longer this morning just to see if it stops, all right? Uh, but Jay and Michelle will be available if we're able to fellowship outside. If we're not able to do that, then they'll regret not being able to chat with you, and I know you will with them, uh, but please be in prayer for them. I'm sure most, if not all of us, are familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan, recorded in Luke chapter 10. That's not where we're going to study, I'm referring to it. But that's the story that Jesus told of the Jewish man who went down from Jerusalem to, Ju to Jericho. Along the way, he was attacked by thieves. Uh, he was robbed and wounded and left for dead. Uh, sometime later, a Jewish priest came by and saw him lying there in his wounded state. But this religious Jewish man, the priest, went to the other side of the road and passed on by, kept on going, and did absolutely nothing to help him, uh, his own countrymen. Sometime later, a Levite, another religious Jewish person, came and saw him and did the same thing, passed on by and left him there in his wounded state, doing absolutely nothing to help him. But then came a man from Samaria, a man from another culture, if you will, and he saw the wounded man lying there. And unlike the two religious Jewish men, men, he had compassion on him. And he went and ministered to him and addressed his wounds. He then placed him on his animal, took him to an inn, where he continued to care for him throughout the day. And the next morning when he left, he left money for the innkeeper to continue caring for the needs of this wounded man and promising to pay more uh, when he returned if that was necessary, as the innkeeper would care for him in his recovery. That's the story that Jesus told to teach what it means to love one's neighbor as themselves. A penetrating story to his Jewish audience as he told it, because Jewish people and Samaritan people did not like one another. The two Jewish men, a religious Jewish man who came by, did absolutely nothing to help their own countrymen. But the Samaritan man did. You know, I love that story, the story of the Good Samaritan. I think most of us are very familiar with that. I'm sure you like it as well. But this morning we're going to study or begin to study the story of the not so good Samaritan. We know the story of the Good Samaritan, right? But maybe we're not so familiar with the story of the not-so-good Samaritan. We're talking about a woman who had a very messy life, but a woman who would have a life-changing encounter with Christ, and a woman who would be used to reach her entire village with the gospel of Christ. The story of the not-so-good Samaritan can be found for us in John chapter 4. That is where we're going to study this morning, thank you for finding your way there. Another great story in the scriptures, and as always, the scriptures will be on the screen this morning if you need to follow along in that way. So I'm looking forward to this. I think we're going to really just be able to introduce it this morning, get started maybe a little bit, and then continue in our next session. This is a great passage of scripture uh, to begin our global ministry emphasis today and for the next two Sundays at least as well. So I hope we're ready. 
This passage of scripture has a lot of challenge. So I hope we're ready for challenge as we see Jesus on a mission. Yes, Jesus was a missionary. We see Jesus on a mission, on a mission to minister to a very messy life, on a mission to engage in cross-cultural ministry. So we're going to see all of that as we work our way through this passage. So let's set the context, shall we? That's always important. A little bit of context, a little bit of background. Let's understand Jesus is early on in his public ministry. He had recently been in Jerusalem for Passover. It was during that time that he drove the money changers out of the temple as he declared to the religious leaders that the temple was his father's house and that his father wasn't pleased that they were conducting business in this place of worship. And of course, that didn't sit well with the religious leaders, that confrontation as they questioned his authority. Sometime later, he met with another religious man, a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. And to Nicodemus, he declared himself to be the son of God and the way to eternal life. He declared to Nicodemus the necessity of believing in him in order to be born again and to receive the spiritual birth that Jesus, only Jesus, could give, the birth that he came to give. And so soon after his encounter with Nicodemus, Jesus then moved out of Jerusalem into the Judea, Judean wilderness, the countryside, if you will, uh, to continue his ministry and to move away from the growing hostility of the religious leaders. That's an important note for our study this morning. So as we pick up things this morning in John chapter 4, we're now going to see Jesus departing there, departing the wilderness of Judea to return to Galilee. That will result in a stop in a place called Samaria, a place where Jesus would reach a Samarian woman and her entire village with the good news of salvation, the salvation that Jesus came to bring and to make possible. So understanding all of that background, notice with me this morning, verses 1 through 3, where John writes, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And so as Jesus moved out into the Judean countryside, people were coming to him. People were believing in him. People were beginning to follow him. People were being baptized by his disciples. In other words, they were publicly professing their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, we're told here, and this is an important note, that his disciples were baptizing more disciples than John. We're talking about John the Baptist, not John the writer, but John the Baptist, the forerunner of Messiah. And that was in fulfillment of what John had already declared, declaring that he, as the forerunner of Messiah, must decrease while the ministry of Messiah must increase. John was the forerunner. Jesus was the Messiah. And so we see here Jesus' ministry increasing while John's ministry begins to decrease. But we also see Jesus now leaving Judea for Galilee. We're talking about leaving southern Israel for northern Israel. We're talking about Jesus returning to the region of his upbringing, to the place where he would spend much of his time with his disciples in his public ministry. Verse 1 gives us the reason for his departure. This is important. The reason the Pharisees were aware that the popularity of Jesus and his ministry was increasing. They were aware of that from Jerusalem. People in Jerusalem were being very receptive to the miracles that Jesus had been doing while in Jerusalem. And not only that, they had already been antagonistic toward John and his ministry. They had already been antagonistic toward Jesus in regard to his cleansing of the temple questioning his authority to do such a thing. So that hostility is increasing. Jesus knew that. He knew that that hostility would grow. 
And ultimately, those religious leaders would be determined to put him to death, to condemn him to die. And so Jesus now, still early on in his public ministry, departed Judea at this point because his death wasn't on their timetable. It was on God's timetable. It would be according to God's appointed time. And so Jesus departed for a period of time to continue his public ministry in a more receptive environment, Galilee. You know, perhaps we need a reminder this morning that our Lord Jesus Christ, because this is really the essence of missions, the Lord Jesus Christ ultimately would face the full force of the religious religious leaders' hostility. He departed for now, you know, because his death would be on God's timetable, but ultimately he would face the full force of that hostility. Our Lord Jesus Christ ultimately would return to Jerusalem later in his public ministry, and he would allow those religious leaders to condemn him to death and to nail him to a cross. And he would allow that to happen in order to make the payment for sin. He did that for us. We we should be moved by that. We didn't deserve that, but he did that for you and me. But he also did that, ladies and gentlemen, for the entire world. He laid down his life and suffered and bled and died ultimately for the entire world. And this morning, I want us to be reminded that that is something that the Lord Jesus Christ expects us individually and corporately to make known to our world, you know, to people around us, to our world. He expects us to make known that he has made the payment for sin. The payment that God demanded for the gift of salvation to be made possible. And so from a global standpoint, that's why we have partnerships with missionaries. That's why. So they can help us. So they can support us in our great commission endeavor to make that news known to the world. Here's what I want us to understand, having said that this morning. Please understand this, because I want us as a church to value greatly missionaries. We are not just supporting them. They are supporting us. We partner with them. They partner with us. They are supporting us and helping us to get out the message that Jesus said he expects us to get out. And that is the message that he died and made the payment for sin and that whoever believes in him as personal Savior will have their sins forgiven and the certain promise of eternal life. And so that's why we have these missionary partnerships. You know, as a small church, we have, for our size, we have several meaningful ones, financially invested. But we are not just supporting them. We are not just partnering with them. They are partnering with us, and they are supporting you and me. That's how I see it. That's how all of us should see it. Right? That's how we should see it. And of course, I'll have to throw this in if you don't mind. It is giving to missions that enables us to have those partnerships. You know, it doesn't just trickle down from the sky. And then we, you know, have these partnerships. It's a result of the people of God loving the Lord Jesus Christ and wanting his message to be made known to the world, to live sacrificially in a way that they may be able to give something to missions that we might be able to have these awesome partnerships. Like Jay and Michelle, with Jay and Michelle, and a strategic ministry in a situation where the world has come to them, and they have the opportunity to impact and to share the good news of Jesus with the ultimate hope that those international students and scholars will have opportunity with other people in their own nation and culture. So, but as giving to missions. 
that enables us to have those partnerships. So let's not forget that. So Jesus has departed Judea. I want you to notice with me his route. This is so important. Verse 4 tells us, but he needed to go through Samaria. That's interesting. Samaria was a region uh, about in north central Israel, about 45 miles or so north of Jerusalem. It was a region that also contained a city called Samaria, along with several other small villages and cities like the one we're going to see here in just a moment. It's interesting that John stated that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Going through Samaria to Galilee was the most direct route. But it was also the most difficult route. As it would take the Jewish traveler through rugged mountain terrain. So there was an alternative route. The alternative route was to go up through the Jordan Valley to the east and then into Galilee. This was a less direct route, but a much easier route from a travel standpoint. And this was the route that was often taken by Jewish travelers coming from Jerusalem up into Galilee, uh, that is up through the Jordan Valley. But that wasn't just for the ease of travel. That was because they wanted to avoid contact with the Samaritans. So understanding that, there's a lot of background between Jewish people and Samaritan people that need to be understood, that needs to be understood in order to be able to really appreciate uh, the full meaning of this story, this encounter that we're headed towards. So we're going to take a moment to understand it this morning. All right, you with me? Okay, is everybody with me? You don't, you don't look like you're with me. I want you to be with me. This is important background. I'm not going to repeat it next Sunday morning. So please be with me. There was a long history of conflict between the Jewish people and the Samaritan people that included racial tension and it included religious tension. The racial tension dated all the way back to 722 B.C., Israel's first captivity, God's judgment on them as a nation, uh, when the Assyrians took the ten northern tribes of Israel into captivity and exiled them out of Israel. At the same time, during that exile, the Assyrians imported people from other pagan cultures into northern Israel, who then intermarried with the Jewish people, some of the Jewish people who had been allowed to remain in the land. And so the result of that was a mixed people known as the Samaritans. And because they were considered to be a mixed people, they weren't considered to be full-blooded Jewish people. And as a result of that, they were generally despised by the Jewish people who were full-blooded. This is pretty relevant, isn't it? You see the ugliness, and I underscore the ugliness, and the wall of racism from whatever direction it comes is absolutely nothing new. It existed in Jesus' day. And Jesus is about about to show us how to really break down those walls and those barriers and that ugliness. And if you want to know in advance, and you're going to see it throughout this passage of Scripture, the answer to breaking all of that down is Him and His Word and His truth, His Gospel. So there was racial tension. There was also religious tension between Jewish people and the Samaritans. Sometime later, the Jewish people were taken into their second captivity, the Babylonian captivity, around 586 B.C. Sometime later, some of them were allowed to return to southern Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, and to begin rebuilding the temple. The Samaritans, in their kindness, offered to help. But guess what? That help was rejected. They were denied because the Jewish people believed that they weren't full-blooded Jewish, and so as a result, they rejected their offer. And as a result of that rejection, the Samaritans were upset. 
And as a result of that, they built their own temple and their own mode of worship on a place called Mount Gerizim, which will come into play in this story here in just a little while. And so the result of their own worship would be the combination of Judaism, but also pagan worship. In fact, the Samaritans would only accept the first five books of the Old Testament scriptures, and they made significant modifications to those in order to fit their religious system. And so there was this great hostility between the Jewish people and the Samaritan people. That's what makes the story of the Good Samaritan so amazing. And that's what really makes this story so amazing. There was this great tension, this great conflict that had a long history. And so as a result of that, the average Jewish traveler would not go through Samaria. The average Jewish traveler would go up through the Jordan Valley. But John here very carefully tells us that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Not because of the route. Because there was a woman there with a very messy life who was ripe for spiritual harvest. Because there was a village there that was ripe for spiritual harvest. In addition, Jesus had his disciples with him and they needed a visual lesson in cross-cultural ministry as ultimately all of this would be their responsibility. See, what Jesus is doing here is modeling. He's modeling for them. He's modeling for you and me. Modeling for them in advance the very last command that he would give to them after his resurrection and shortly before he ascended to heaven. Those words are recorded for us in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Where Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, listen, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Samaria was included in that command. Meaning, cross-cultural ministry was included in that command. You see, let's let that remind us again that Jesus didn't just die to pay for the sin of the Jewish people or the American people. He died to make the payment for sin for all people, including the Samaritan people. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is for all nations, for all cultures, for all people. And that is why the church collectively and the believer individually has the responsibility, listen, the responsibility to participate in and to engage in cross-cultural ministry. And we can do that several different ways. By praying for nations and cultures, by praying for those who are going Uh, by giving to support those who are going to do that, and also to go as we're called to go. So I'm glad. I'm glad that we have a missionary family. I'm glad that we have missions. I'm glad that we have that focus. I'm glad that this is our vision statement. We've had that from our inception. I'm glad that we have a missionary family that is obedient to Jesus willing to go and willing to engage in cross-cultural ministry in those places where we cannot go. Now, we engage in it here where those opportunities exist, but there are many places that we can't go. And so I'm so glad that we have those partnerships with those who are going where we can't. I think it's a joy. It is a joy and it's a privilege to partner financially and prayerfully with Jay and Michelle, uh, who go across culture certainly, to minister to internationals at Virginia Tech. Again, understand what a strategic ministry that is. So I want to thank you, Jay and Michelle. I want to thank you so much for your willingness to go. 
uh, for your partnering with us and really helping us to do what the Lord has commanded us to do. I'm thankful also for others in our missionary family who are engaged in cross-cultural ministry, partnering with us, you know, helping us to engage as well. So we do that from a missionary standpoint, but we also have some personal responsibility. We have a lot of personal responsibility. You see, all of us, all of us are called, as the Lord gives us opportunity, to engage in cross-cultural ministry with people around us. And we're going to see his model for that here in just a moment. But for now, let's understand, let's just understand this. That regardless of the differences that people may have in regard to nationality and language and color and culture and other background, there is no barrier that is too high for the power of the gospel. None whatsoever. This was a high barrier that Jesus was going to invade. And we're going to see him break it down. And and that's the mindset that we're to have as a believer, as a follower of Christ. There isn't any barrier too high. And we need to be willing to go across those barriers. Even here locally, there are cultural barriers even here on a local basis. I'll share some examples with you here in just a moment or perhaps in our next session. But very quickly this morning, I do want us to see before we finish We're not going to finish everything this morning, but I do want us to see Jesus' arrival. Arrival in Samaria, as verse 5 tells us. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. So city really means village. We're talking about a relatively small village. That's what that was, the, the village of Sychar. This place is known in the Old Testament. It's known in the Old Testament as Shechem, a significant place in Jewish history, uh, a place where Jacob, Jacob became Israel, uh, bought a parcel of land that ultimately he gave to his son Joseph. And this is where Joseph's body was ultimately buried after his body was brought out of Egypt and back to Israel. And so right in the background of all of this was also Mount Gerizim, another well-known place in Israel's history, and the place of Samaritan worship at this point in history. So we're told in verse 6, now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied from his journey sat thus by the well. If you're looking for it, there isn't a reference in the Old Testament to Jacob's well specifically. But we know Jacob dug wells here. Lots of wells, no doubt. Jacob had a large company of people. Jacob had a great number of livestock, so he certainly dug wells. And this specific well, the traditional site of this well, is still known today. And so this was the stopping point for Jesus, the well, which was outside the village of Sychar, probably about a half mile or so. And so John notes here very carefully that Jesus sat by the well because he was weary, meaning he was fatigued. We're talking about a long, hard journey from the Judean countryside up into Samaria. And so John is very careful throughout his gospel to note both Jesus' deity, that he was God in human flesh, and at the same time, His humanity. Let's understand that. That's important. You see, as God in human flesh, Jesus experienced the full reality of his humanity without sin. And so he was tired. That was real. We'll see in a moment he was thirsty. That was real. He sent his disciples into the village to buy food. That's noted a little bit later. So he was hungry along with them. And so now we see him sitting sitting by the well. And that's strategic. Jesus is sitting there by this well because he's about to use this well. 
He's about to use the well as a part of his evangelistic strategy. You know, to introduce a very sinful woman to the water of everlasting life. That's why Jesus is here. That's why he's in Sychar. To introduce her to the water that gives life to her and her village. John tells us in verse 6, it was about the sixth hour. So John in his gospel, writing to a broad audience, not just Jewish, but also Gentile, he normally used Roman time. So that tells us it was about 6 p.m. So this was a strategic time. Why was it strategic? Because this was the normal time for people from the village, namely women, to come and draw water from the well. So here's the thing, and this is a great thing for us to wrap up our study on this morning. I want us to see that Jesus was intentionally and strategically placed at a strategic time for an evangelistic encounter. I hope we're not surprised by that. I mean, we shouldn't be, because everything that we have seen about Jesus so far in this passage has been intentional. It has been strategic. We're talking about the route. We're talking about the place. We're talking about the well. We're talking about the time. You see, Jesus was intentional and strategic because this was his passion. His passion was to reach people with the gift of his message, the message of salvation, the message of forgiveness. I love that. Jesus was intentional and strategic. I love it, but it challenges me. You know, that's probably something that In fact, I say probably, I think I'm pretty sure I know that it is something that is often missing in most of our lives in the life of the average Christian that is looking to be intentional and strategic and sharing the message of Christ with others. So yeah, I put myself into that category. I know I need more of it, more intentional, more strategic. I'm sure you probably feel the same way. You see, instead of being intentional and strategic in evangelism, the truth is we often run from it. We try to put it out of our minds. We often try to relieve ourselves of that privilege and that responsibility. And you know, we can do that so much that over time we can forget that it is our personal privilege and responsibility. And here's the thing. I think it grieves our Lord. You know, when we come to that point, I think it grieves him because here's the thing. He wants to use us church. Yes. You and me personally. Yes. Also, he wants to use us to share the greatness of his salvation with others. He wants to use us to share the message of forgiveness and eternal life with others. And I think it grieves him when we get into a pattern of neglecting that responsibility of being intentional and strategic. You see, I think it grieves him because here's the thing, the Lord Jesus Christ who laid down his life for us, he wants you and me to love him enough that in spite of fear, or the fear of rejection, or whatever it is that may challenge us. He wants us to love him enough that we are willing to say yes and let him use us to share the message of who he is with others. But now here's the thing. I don't want us to be on a guilt trip about that. I want us to be concerned about that, but rather be on a guilt trip. trip, Let's understand the key. You said the key to being more intentional and strategic isn't for you to sit there and feel guilty and then go out and try harder because the try harder probably won't last very long. The key to being more strategic and intentional in reaching out with the message of Christ, the key is being in love with him. The key is being close to him. The key is really worshiping him. 
and loving him and being devoted to him and knowing him and fellowship with, fellowshipping with him deeply. You see, that's the starting point. The starting point for intentional and strategic, which we all should have and, and be a part of, is him and our relationship with him. The starting point is our worship of him. You see, that's the fuel. It's not just a fuel for missionaries to go out and do missions. It's the fuel for you and me to go into the places in our culture, even across culture, and to reach out to people with messy lives who need to hear about Jesus and to share with them his love. That's the key. If you don't take anything else away this morning, please take that away. The key for this to be more of a reality in all of our lives. And what a strategic time God has given us. We like to focus on all the negatives. What about the positive? What about the positive that our world is in such a mess and we have the answer? We have the answer that can change human hearts. The message of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what a time for you and me to draw near to him and to love him and to fellowship with him and to be intimate in our relationship with him and let that be the motivation. To reach out and share the good news of who he is. And you know what? More love for him and more intentional sharing of him is certainly needed. As folks, there is absolutely no shortage of lost people right here around us. So let's remember, Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Where do we need to go? First to him, our relationship with him. And then where do we need to let that take us in regard to our personal privilege and responsibility to reach out. We'll continue this in our next session. We're going to get into the actual encounter of Jesus with this woman, and we're going to make several important observations. So I hope you're able to be back with us in our next session. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we're so grateful this morning for the message of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who ultimately face the hostility of those religious leaders to give his life for us on the cross, to make our forgiveness possible, to make our reconciliation with you possible. So thank you. Thank you for the model of our Lord in going to Samaria to reach a woman and a village with the message of who he was and what he came to do. And thank you that we now have been given that privilege and responsibility as the body of Christ and as individual believers to make that known to our world. So, Father, thank you also that we've been reminded that the key to staying connected with that and for that to become a regular part of our lives is staying close to you, your Son, living in deep fellowship and giving you deep worship. And then letting that move us to want other people to know you and to worship you. So, Father, keep that before us uh, throughout this day, throughout this week. And then, Lord, as we love you, give us opportunity. Create opportunity that we could never imagine to be able to share who you are with others. And again, thank you for our missionary family, for Jay and Michelle, for others in our missionary family who are going and looking to go across culture and share the message of Jesus with others. Thank you for them. Give them encouragement, I pray, Father, in all that they're doing for the glory and the sake of your name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.